So for the final um, talk of the first session, Dr. John Bismuth uh, here from Methodist is going to speak about um, new advances in um, endovascular um, technologies. Um, also on the um, pollev.com, you can go to pollev.com Methodist on a computer and uh, ask questions through the same uh, site um, besides texting. So we'll, we'll do questions next. All right, thank you. Except Dr. Business is in Florida, so I'm uh, Carlos Bichar, I'm one of the vascular surgeons uh, here. Let me see, is that gonna? All right. So I'm gonna talk about advances in, uh, in TIVA, shifting a little bit of gear, but actually we'll, eventually we'll all will tie into the aortic valves and the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, so you, you've seen all sorts of endosomes. They can pretty much affect any, any uh, vessel. Uh, you know, as far as descending thoracic endosome, um, you know, it's been repaired since the 1950s, and actually Dake uh, at Stanford was the first one to exclude one uh, under Vasca in 1994, but the first available commercial uh, T-bar in the US here was in 2005. And obviously by avoiding cross clamping and, and uh, thoracotomy, as you all know, uh, it became a viable alternative to open repair. And also the risks are, you know, uh, if you look at some of the uh, pivotal trials for the different trials, the preoperative mortality between three versus 10 percent. Interesting stroke is uh, kind of similar, but I'll, I'll actually I'll talk a little bit about that later too. And then paraplegia was a little bit less, uh, or much less, with the uh, TVA versus open, and as well as cardiac complications. So um, most, you know, we kind of classify the, the award into zones. So most of the patients that we uh, end up treating, uh, the majority fall in the um, zone three and four. But also, if you look at the zone three, not all of them, uh, you know, as, you, as most of you guys who do this, you need at least two to three centimeters of a healthy landing zone to be able to seal with your T-bar. So, so most times, we actually end up have to, like, cover or partially cover the left subclavian to get good seal in depending also on the series, anywhere between 50 to 60% of the cases. Um, so, um, so the left subclavian artery is a large you know, arch vessel. It supplies the left upper extremity, also supplies the posterior circulation via the via vertebral artery through the spinal cord perfusion, and also the coronary circulation via lima. So, but funny enough, you know, we can cover it, it's, and it's well tolerated usually despite you know, all these important uh, things that it contributes to. So the Society of Vascular Surgery actually uh, came up with some recommendations where they said we should re revascularize the left subclavian during TVAR. It's a grade two level C. And also in anatomy that compresses critical organs. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And also in emergencies, basically they said individualized, but you know, most of us end up covering it like in an emergency and uh, worry about it later. So, uh, and the reason for that is, you know, coverage of last is associated with increase of paraplegia, uh, odds ratio of 2.69, anterior circulation stroke, odds ratio of 2.58, and significant increase of arm ischemia with a significant odds ratio of 47.7, vertebral basal ischemia, 10.8, and phrenic nerve injury was 4.4%. So then, uh, the first group, I believe, was to look at it was the Duke, uh, uh, which Chad Hughes that looked at it, well, we're, we're selective uh, uh, revascularizers. So they looked at their data, and out of the 145 that they actually uh, covered, they only revascularized 32. And, and then again, there's a reason why they did that. You know, they're, you know they're 10, 10 had, they needed spinal cord protection, nine had painted lima to LAD, uh, uh, five because of left arm ischemia um, uh, issues, uh, and then uh, left vertebral artery origin from the arch, dialysis access in, that, in the left arm, and vertebral basal insufficiency. So, um, but what they basically found is that there was like no difference in the rate of death between the selective and the uh, cover, those who are covered and those that were revascularized. Um, even though you can tell like in the death there was a little bit um, um, more like uh, increased death in the revascularized group. Uh, no difference in stroke uh, and then no difference in risk of paraplegia. Um, again, 3.1 versus 0.1 percent, but they had, you know, four complications related to the actual surgical site and the bypass at 9.4 percent. So basically, they said selective revascularization of the left subclavian is, is safe, and it does not increase the events, and surgery is not without its complications. 
So then the, uh, another group of surgeons are like, well, let's look at the large centers. So they, did, uh, they looked at the six large centers and it was uh, international um, uh, centers, not just in the, in, the, in the US. And they also looked at those that have selective revascularization. So uh, they had uh, um, almost 1,200 patients over 10 years. Out of those, 394 were uh, covered the left scaplavian. And then you can see the split, the group B, then those that had no left subclavian revascularization, and then the group C were the ones that end up revascularizing the uh, left subclavian. So overall, the indication for most of these patients was aneurysmal disease, and that's why they did TVAR. Um, and then uh, for the entire study, the cohort of this study, the, again, pretty significant paraplegia, 6% uh, stroke at 6.5%, and mortality within 30 days, 12.4, and total uh, uh, complications at 18.3. But then when they looked at the group, um, uh, no revascularization versus revascularization, basically there was no difference in like paraplegia stroke mortality uh, between, between the two groups. Um, and then basically their conclusion was left subclavian coverage does not increase risk of paraplegia or stroke when selective revascularization is adopted. And then also in that, in that study, they, saw, they thought that left subclavian artery revascularization in women carries increased risk of stroke. So if you look at Cochrane, uh, this, I, have, I didn't actually look at it recently. This was a few months ago when uh, um, I gave this talk at STS here in Houston. So I looked at the Cochrane to see what they have to, to say about it. And actually, literally, there's, there's, this is what they say. They say, you know, highly quali quality randomized control studies evidence uh, are not available and we need it. But as you all know, I mean, it's really hard to, re to like, randomize these patients because in a way, we know the ones that really need it. Uh, so, I mean, these are the ones that really need someone that has patent lima to coronary bypass, uh, someone that has, you know, tiny uh, right uh, vertebral artery. Uh, if you have a, a left vertebral terminating in, in pica, uh, this was a huge one. You know, when I was in training 10 years ago, you know, we kind of work, uh, you know, we had a few case, cases where we got burned and learned more and more about it. Uh, patient has, you know, ex-anatomical bypass coming from the left uh, axillary artery. If they have access in that left arm, um, and obviously the patient with high risk of paraplegia, previous repair, open or endo. So we know these are the high risk. And obviously if you have hypogastric artery occlusion too, they, they fall in that category too. And you know, so the consequences of covering, you know, arm ischemia, left uh, sub, uh, subclavian steel syndrome, stroke, paraplegia, uh, MI, and loss of options to use that arm if you just cover it and you re revascularize, revascularize it. Uh, so, um, so what, how can you reverse the left subclavian? So the most common one is just doing a bypass, uh, followed by, you know, some people do transpositions. Uh, there's something called in-situ frustrations, uh, which is not FDA approved. I'll show you some pictures, and obviously I'll go over some of the branched uh, uh, devices that we have. So this is probably the most common operation that we do. You do a supraclavicular incision, you do the bypass, and then you basically do the, do the stenting. Most times you end up using six to eight millimeter Dacron, and then, um, um, we actually use a transcranial uh, uh, monitoring here, and then, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it and why we think it's, it's helpful uh, in, in, on the, in these cases. Uh, so this is a patient that we treated here, uh, was a dissection uh, patient, cocaine-induced, and he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were able to calm him down for a couple weeks uh, with antihypertensive, but he still had this like kind of achy, nagging pain in between his shoulder blades. And eventually we did it like a week or 10 days later and we did the, we did the bypass as you can see on the top. And then we did the uh, uh, exclusion with a stent. And then you can see his, that's his left subclavian, it's huge. Uh, that's his vertebral. So we end up using two amplets plugs and still there was still some filling. Uh, and then we end up finishing with some coils in between. Uh, and again, you don't really have to take it all the way. All you wanna try to do is just basically shut down the flow um, uh, going in re retrograde into, the into that aneurysmal segment from the dissection, the chest, um, and then, you know, uh, and actually on the follow-up scan, it's not very uh, obvious, but you can actually see it on its own, kind of the cloth thrombosed and stopped at the level of the vertebral artery. So you don't really have to like, coil all the way up and run into problems. Um, and this is the patient, you know, I, I did this case and then had to fly out and then they, uh, one of my partners almost took the patient for evacuation of hematoma, but it wasn't a hematoma, it was just a patient you know, has uh, from COPD and, and smoking, he had this uh, puffiness in both sides. Um, so make, examine the patients before, before you take them to the OR. Um, so this is actually a case that we um, also did. Um, uh, this is a patient that had uh, this uh, uh, pseudoendrism and he had uh, also an aberrant right subclavian, sorry, aberrant right subclavian. So you can see in this case, we elected to do a transposition. We had, a, you know, I find it easier to do on the right side. Uh, so we did the transposition. 
And then uh, we end up also putting an extra stand in the left uh, uh, subplane to get more purchase with the stand and then to exclude it. And then patient did uh, uh, really nice. He had also some, some chest pain that actually, fun enough, that went away uh, after we did this repair. Um, so what else, again, this is not FDA approved. This is called in-situ fenestration. Uh, John Peneton in, in East Virginia has a larger series. Uh, at the more, uh, beginning of this year, he presented his uh, series. Now he's up to 55 cases. Uh, it's it's a compassionate use. So basically what he does, it, it, these are basically emergency cases. He goes in, he put the stents. He, now he's done it for all zones, not just for uh, two or three. So, uh, so he's done it for all zones. And uh, basically he covers the, let's say, left subclavian that goes in. You know, make sure you have a nice 90-degree um, uh, uh, support with the sheath all the way down on the stent graft, and then this is a laser, spectral analytics laser. Basically, a small hole through it, puts a wire through it, pre-dilates with a three-millimeter balloon, just kind of open it, and then eventually stents it. And, and like I said, he's done it for up to zone zero. So he, you know, again, it's an emergency. You know, patients tolerate a little bit of ischemia. And also he's done a patient that had patent lima to LAD, uh, where he puts a stent in, cover, you know, basically covered that subclavian and went in. And, and, and obviously now he became proficient and really fast. So like in a couple of minutes, he's revascularized and establishing flow. So what about uh, branched endografts? Uh, so, uh, so the one that on feasibility trials, Gore Matronic here in the US, we're actually part of the uh, Gore trial um, uh, here. Uh, this is the Mona Lisa, the Matronic, uh, with a single branch for the left subclavian. Uh, I'm not honestly familiar with the device. I'm more, more familiar with this device. This is the Gore single branch device. This is the do docking system. It's a pre-wired. So, and then usually what we like to do, we like to have a through and through wire from the arm and the femoral for support. And then uh, it comes in obviously different sizes um, to revascularize. Um, and sometimes, you know, you run issues, you need, there's a certain minimum that you, you need to have between the left uh, common carotid and left subclavian for it to seal. Uh, so this is a, a also a case that we did here. It's very important that you make sure that the wires are not wrapped. So you want to make sure that they're you had, you either as you're coming up or as you're coming, you're rotating, and make sure the, the, there's no wire wrap. Uh, very very important. And then sorry, it's not very clear here, but you can see once we deployed, now we're half through and through wire, and basically we're putting the sheath through the docking system into the subclavian, and eventually we pass the stand through it on sheath the uh, pull back on the sheath and while the stent is in position and deploy the stent. And then uh, this, is, uh, this is basically what we had, really good repair. And as you can tell, you know, tight arch, and, uh, but see how nice now these devices, are, they conform really nice to the, to the anatomy of the arch, much better than what, what we had uh, when we first started doing this, um, you know, 10, 10 years ago or more than 10 years ago. So what's our, th our threshold uh, here, you know, I'm, uh, I always like what Dr. Reardon uh, uh, says, you know, we, we have residents and fellows that we want to teach them how to do the cross subclavian bypass. And, uh, but anyway, basically we have low threshold, threshold to doing it. We actually like to reverse the left subclavian in pretty much all elective cases. And pretty much we do bypass. Uh, if you ask me, one would you do one over the other? So basically we prefer bypass for connective tissue disorder, a patient with aortic dissection. You could argue except cook and use, you can know these are different kind of tissue that you're dealing with. Um, and obviously patients that have Lima to LAD, and we use transcranial uh, uh, Doppler monitoring, and uh, we have access now through uh, branch devices, and sometimes if you have to embolize the orange and sometimes we either go brachial, retrograde, or sometimes from the incision we just stick directly, and then, and then you know, either put, put some coils or the amplats plug uh, from the incision and spare stick in the left brachial artery. So obviously we get comfortable with something, as the uh, you know, previous speakers talked about uh, um, uh, going from the aortic valve to the mitral and tricuspid. And, and so same thing for here. I mean, we're getting more comfortable. So now we're pushing the envelope and going more further up to the zone, zone zero. And these are some of the options that you can, uh, you can do. Uh, this is also the depiction from the Gore, uh, Gore device. This is the uh, Cook device. Uh, which is available in, in, uh, in uh, certain centers are now using it um, in, in the U.S. Uh, there's only like a couple, but you can actually revascularize um, uh, a and left uh, comacrodid, and usually they do a bypass for the, um, for the left subclavian. Um, you know, and again, this is just to show you that the technology for fenestrated and uh, branched endograft is increasing tremendously in the U.S., um, um, so I'm just going to go back a little bit just to emphasize on the risk of stroke. So this is actually a pivotal trial, and this is not just Gore. This is uh, pretty much it was the same results in all the TVAR, and this is zone three and four uh, uh, stenting, and still there was a significant risk of stroke in these patients, you know, 4%. So, um, so obviously we're going to march into the arch. The risk of stroke is going to be, is gonna be uh, much, uh, much higher. 
Um, and you know, obviously, all these procedures we, we do, we think you know, stroke incidents cannot be used to you know, you know, troubleshoot these procedures. And uh, basically, we need to do a better job identifying these risks of, of strokes. So, and then it could be multifactorial. Uh, and I'll show you some slides about embolization. There's a, a, a surgeon in Germany, uh, Thilo Kobel, who believes in air embolization. We're actually doing some research with him here with DCD, uh, where we can to try to de-air some of the stents, uh, particulate, hyperperfusion, hyperperfusion, and also something you can pick up on TCD when we see hyperperfusion in these patients, even like after coronary and, and tractomy, which help us to auto-relegate the blood pressure, and then uh, also the, uh, the bleeding. Um, and then, uh, I mean, one of the, I guess, argument against TCD is that people say, well, it's too sensitive. And you can see here by just sitting there, I mean, there's a little bit of delay, but just sitting there not doing anything before we deploy the stent, you can see there's some hits which we call hits in the, on the TCD, those white marks coming up. And then obviously, once we deploy the, the device, you can tell there's a rush of, uh, of hits. Um, um. But then again, we don't know how much of it's significant. I mean, a lot of times we see this patient wakes up and is doing fine. Uh, so that's pretty much, pretty much one of the uh, criticism. But on the other hand, you know, the problem that we have also, you know, talking to our cardiac colleagues here, we, who we have an you know, excellent relationship with, uh, is that, you know, we put the patient to sleep. We do the procedure. We put patients, for example, on the cardiopulmonary bypass. We wake up the patient, and you know, sometimes they have a stroke, uh, and then we say, we need to fix something. And the problem, we don't know when it happened. So, and, uh, but that's the nice thing about TCD is that, you know, is that TCD can help us, you know, at least we know there are some issues happening during this part of the procedure versus that part of the procedure. Maybe we can try modify or, or do something about it. And, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of you guys use uh, uh, cerebral oximetry. Um, so if you look at some of the results for open aortic arch surgery, I mean, even uh, for those uh, uh, cases in the, in, the, in, the, in the very experienced centers, I mean, they still have rates of 5.5% for elective and 10% for emergency with total arch uh, risk of neurological uh, uh, events. Uh, and same thing for hemi arch replacement. So it's not insignificant. Uh, it's still, still significantly a risk of stroke. And same thing applies for endovascular. So if you look at the series from... Uh, this is also international series, uh, majority uh, uh, in Europe. Again, uh, they had six, uh, six patients, 15, almost 16% that had stroke uh, with a thoracic, with arch uh, uh, stenting. Um, uh, one, uh, four, four TIAs, one stroke, and one subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then later, these uh, kind of some of the authors from that initial group, they looked at their data. They're like, well, we got better about it. We're more careful. And then so they had 27 patients in, that, in this series. And what they've done uh, is uh, they bring the patient a few days before the uh, arch stenting. They do the uh, left subclavian revascularization. And then a day or two later, they did the arch stenting. But still, uh, it, they lowered it. But still, you know, three uh, three patients, 11% had a neurological event. So, um, so it's still significant. And then obviously it's multifactorial, as you all know. Um, uh, it could be related to many, many, many factors. But obviously a type of disease, interestingly enough, uh, is, uh, is obviously a factor, as we know. You know. And then I'm sure a lot of you guys, in a way, they're surprised at why they section. Usually they have clean vessels, right? So why they section have also high, such a high incidence of stroke? So is it something else? Is it air? Uh, compared to the patient that have aneurysm and some of the you know uh, particulates in the in the arch, uh, but it's 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 not insignificant. And, and and again, the nice thing about TCD not only will tell us about the hits, also tell us about you know flow, direction, the velocity. If there's a change from baseline, you know, uh, so it gives gives us all these um, uh, all these information. And then also it could tell us there was no emboli. Um, uh, for example, when we do, for those who are familiar with the uh, silk road device, where we do reversal flow in the ICA, so when we deployed the stent and we ballooned, there were zero hits. So the reversal flow is effective. We didn't detect any, any hits with TCD when we do these cases here. And again, so we can monitor basically the uh, uh, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and the, and the vertebral. And the nice thing about it, I, you know, a few weeks ago, I was called during an anterior spine surgery, and they actually injured the left vertebral artery. You know, patients intubated, what should we do? I mean, obviously tough, prepared to do it from here, but what was the nice thing about it is that actually I brought in the technician, we did TCD, and he said, well, there's recent flow um, in the uh, um, uh, hind, uh, hind brain, so probably the right uh, vert is, is good enough and compensating for it. So it's good to have that, you know, and then sure enough, the patient woke up and he did fine after we just ligated his, uh, his left vertebral artery. So it, it, it does help us a lot and gives us some, some information in, uh, during surgery. And we, we've, you know, published, my, my partners also uh, um, they published quite a bit on it. 
Uh, this is just a picture. I'll just go through the slides. Looks like I'm running out of time here. And we actually looked initially during TVAR, like I said, we actually looked at the number of hits during each procedure, wire up, pigtail up, soft wire, second stiffer, stiffer wire, device, as you, can see, as you can imagine, during device develop were the highest number of hits. And, then as, and not insignificant during ballooning. When you deploy the stent and you balloon it, actually there was a lot of hits. So that's something you can modify. You can say, well, you know, maybe if you have a good seal, we size it, maybe we should avoid ballooning. So it does help you change your practice a little bit. It's not, you know, just doing it just for the sake of, of doing these procedures. So, um, and then now we have also remote monitoring. I mean, we have, you know, Dr. Grami who's here uh, and he's uh, one of the world experts in TCD, but he, you know, he travels a lot. So at least now we're trying to connect with him remotely and have him also um, uh, read for us. Um, so again, this is the arch uh, stenting. So I'm gonna shift gear a little bit. I know I'm uh, running out of time. I'm shift gear a little bit about the type A dissection. And then, um, uh, you know, as we all, as we all uh, you know, the, the surgeons and audience, they know that uh, uh, these patients, especially the patients that have previous uh, cardiac surgery, they're high risk for um, a type A, uh, uh, they, when a type A dissection happens for repair. And then uh, if you look at the, um, um, uh, median, median age are usually older than a patient that had previous chest surgery. Uh, they're five times more likely to have coronary artery disease. There's, they have a higher in-hospital mortality, and then they have a lower survival. So obviously not a, not a fun to go into the chest again for these patients. And then in the IRAD, there was 20% of the patients uh, with uh, type A dissection were unfit for surgery. So obviously, you know, we're getting comfortable with the TVAR, so the question is, what can we do for type A dissection? Uh, same thing, you know, we're pushing the envelope again. Uh, so these are some of the earlier literature. I'm just gonna focus on uh, uh, Lu et al. trial from China, because they had the largest uh, uh, series, 15 patients. They used the Cook uh, TX2, which is actually the device that we use for TVARs. Um, and then uh, um, uh, it was published in the Journal of Medical College of Cardiology. Um, and then basically these were the indications, uh, five acute, 10 chronic, um, and, and they had excellent results. This is also a picture from their, from their, for their series. Uh, and the nice thing about the stent is, you know, it fit uh, the length of the arch and they covered the, uh, the tear uh, in the ascending. Um, and then the idea is that you're not really curing in this case, but at least you're depressurizing the false, lose, false lumen and then you avoid propagation of dissection and aneurysm growth and eventually rupture. And that's a whole idea. And um, so let me just show you just for sake of time. So what they've done also, so they had, interesting enough, they had zero cerebral events in, the, in, that, in that series. But also what they found, which also great, is that remodeling happens, not just in the ascending, uh, but also in the descending. And part of it, even though they were not stented, but because now you, you, you opened up the true lumen proximally, then also the true lumen distally remodeled, which is also you know, uh, fascinating for these, uh, for these cases. So also here with Dr. Reardon and Dr. Bismuth, my partner, we actually um, uh, part of the GORE ascending trial here. Um, I won't go through the inclusion, inclusion criteria, but you can see the tear here, and uh, this is the, uh, it's an eight centimeter uh, uh, st uh, long stand that we, we've had, we've done a few cases here. So I'm, I'm just uh, finish up. I know everyone wants to go on the break, but uh, obviously technology is evolving and it's improving. Um, and then eventually, like the previous speaker talked about, now we're gonna be doing endo pretty much from the valve all the way down, uh, you know, inc including we have now iliac uh, branch devices so we can treat uh, all the way down. And now some companies are developing, actually putting a valve on the, on the stent um, to uh, at the same time kind of put a valve in, in the, in the a vertex valve and also stent the ascending. So that's being, being done. So I won't be you know, uh, far from being uh, in practice. Um, but still, I believe in the risk of stroke is, is very, very important. I think that's what's gonna really limit these, uh, some of these uh, 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 surgeries that we do. There's a lot of research being done on bullet protection devices. I'm not sure if you guys saw the new proposed um, uh, standards for neuro endpoint in clinical trials by Dr. Lansky, but that's, that's really gonna be a game changer. I mean, they're looking at, I think they called it grade 2A, where they looked at uh, uh, MRI uh, uh, diffusion uh, um, strokes, and, that's, and they're actually labeling it stroke even though the patient is okay. So, so that's gonna change a lot what we do, but obviously there's a lot of research, research being done how we can protect the brain during this. I think TCD is gonna play a, v a valuable uh, role here uh, in these cases and in the cases uh, that you guys are involved in. And then, um, you know, we're like I said, we're actually doing some research on air embolism and see if we can de-air some of these, uh, some of the air of those grafts. Uh, some of it is being done here too in collaboration with Germany. Um, so thank you for your attention.